Oh, that sounds good. Hey, everyone. My name is Santos Nalu. I work at Distant Networks. Um, our office is based out of Arlington, Virginia. We have about four other offices in San Francisco, Stockholm, London, and Raleigh. Um, I work as a solutions engineer at Distant Networks. I've been uh, with the company for the last two years. So let me start off by asking you guys, what is a bot? Do you, go, do you guys know what, what this session is about? So um, Drupal basically partnered with our, our, our company so that they can protect their web applications from automated threats, which are trying to um, generate fake registrations on their website. And at the same time, um, they're also trying to use our high definition fingerprinting technology to identify uh, users who are trying to create multiple fake um, accounts. So let's see how, you know, how Drupal used us for this uh, use case. But um, let me come back to my question again. Does, does anyone know what a bot is? Yes. So account, creating accounts is one of the use cases, but a bot is basically a, uh, a piece of script or a tool uh, which, which makes HTTP requests to a web application. And uh, you could also use tools like Selenium, which automatically drive legitimate browsers like Chrome or Firefox, so that you don't have to manually keep doing what, you, what you're doing. So you can basically pick up a list of username and passwords and start you know, brute forcing a login. Similarly, you can write a script to use a list of usernames and passwords to create new accounts. So Drupal has been fighting uh, fake user registrations for a long time, and it was difficult to, to stop this spam or, you know, or account, uh, fake account creation um, using manual techniques like IP blocking, because the bots landscape has been improving day, day by day. So as soon as you block a specific IP, um, the, the bots start using proxies or you know, other ways to basically, or VPNs to basically attack your website. And it's easy for them to keep cycling through IPs. But from a security standpoint, it's a nightmare because um, it's hard to keep track of these IPs and you know, play the whack-a-mole game and start blocking IPs because you know, they keep coming back. And that's one of the main reasons why this still came up with the, um, with the concept of browser fingerprinting. Well, browser fingerprinting existed before the still, but then we took it, we hardened it, we tried, you know, we built our solution around it. So let's, let's talk through the networks and how we partnered with, the, uh, with Drupal to help uh, mitigate their issues with automation. So Distill is uh, a solution which has been helping thousands of websites from automated threats. The use cases for automated threats can be uh, can, can range from um, web scraping or uh, account fraud or spam and, and, and so on. And we'll talk about a few of them as part of this presentation. But Gartner recognized this still as the only bot mitigation vendor in 2015 and 2016. And recently, SE Magazine uh, awarded us, uh, you know, the, the winner, uh, recognized us as a winner for uh, fraud prevention. And we have a, a bunch of logos at the bottom so that you know uh, who we work with. A anyone uh, familiar with Neiman Marcus? And you, did you guys hear about the attack on Neiman Marcus? Yeah, so last year there was an attack on Neiman Marcus where um, a bot was uh, buying different username and credential, you know, credential um, combinations, username and password combinations. And they were trying these username and password combinations against their login. And once they are behind the login, they get really sensitive information about um, individual users. And they were trying to basically use this information for bad activities. That is, you know, they take the credit card or, or buy stuff and stuff and, and, and so on. So after that attack, Neiman Marcus started looking into, you know, bot mitigation solutions. And that's when they discovered that Distill is the leader in this space, and they, they started partnering with us. Uh, StubHub, anyone buy tickets from StubHub? All right. So uh, scalping is one of the major issues with ticketing industries, because uh, we, there, we know that there's uh, bots which are out there, which are trying to uh, hold tickets and buy tickets uh, cheap, and then they're trying to resell them so that they can make some money out of it. So it's a huge problem, and legitimate users will, you know, because of this, are not getting access to um, tickets for some of their favorite events. And that's one of the reasons why StubHub 
uh, decided to partner with Distill, and um, you know we stop automation from um, you know from from um, scalping and other um, other threats on on their website. So what were the challenges with uh, bots on the Drupal websites? So spam bots were actually writing comments. They were signing up for you know fake accounts, etc. And the problem is that the Drupal website was um, you know a wide open uh, website for user generated content. So you know anyone can just basically create a login um, and then just uh, you know st start commenting on um, their their website. So the problem with this is, like I mentioned, you know, when people are creating new accounts, you, how would you know if they're fake or not? How would you know if they're you know, legitimate human users coming in from a legitimate browser like Chrome or Firefox? Uh, that was the issue which uh, Drupal was uh, facing. And the problem with the, the modern spam bots is that they are behind proxies. So there can be one specific bot operator who is cycling their HTTP request to 500 or 1,000 different proxies. And you know, it becomes extremely difficult for you to keep track of all the different IPs which they're originating from. You, you won't even know that it's the same user who is accessing your application from this, you know, using these different proxies. The same goes with VPN networks. If I'm a bot operator, I can just subscribe to a VPN network and start cycling through different IPs and, you know, and, and route uh, different HTTP requests through different VPNs. So what was the solution? So the solution was that the still.org, um, you know, they put the registration process through the distill cloud, and we were collecting, um, you know, the high definition fingerprints which distill generates for individual end users, and you know we were basically tracking these users on a on a hash value uh, rather than an IP address. So instead of you know if I'm a, a bot and if I'm cycling through different IPs. Um, because of distill, I was no longer being tracked based on my IP, but based on my uh, fingerprint, which was generated by distill. Uh, and because of that, even though I was cycling through different IPs, it's easy for distill to keep track of this bot and uh, mitigate it. So before distill, there was a high rate of unconfirmed users which were being created on the Drupal website on a daily basis. But once they, you know, Drupal started uh, leveraging Distill's uh, technology, uh, they started blocking uh, a high rate of bots on their website, and at the same time, they also used the high-definition fingerprint for identifying legitimate users, like human users, who were creating multiple fake accounts manually. So there were two different, uh, you know, uh, ways which Distill, Drupal was using Distill. One is to use our automated systems to stop the, uh, the automated bots, and the second uh, use case is to use the high-definition fingerprints and identify human users who are creating multiple accounts. So here's a, a, a graph of uh, the results um, of uh, using, um, you know, b before and after distill. So as you can see, the pink line here is showing us the average number of unconfirmed users uh, before using distill, which is about 300. But then right after they started using distill, it it it, it, it tanked and it it basically ended up around 120, which is a huge difference. Um, and then once, uh, you know, we started fine tuning the system a little bit, and we, you know, the distal platform is a combination of multiple policies. How many of you are experienced with using web application firewalls? Okay, and as you know, a web application firewall is a, uh, is a mix of, uh, you know, has a mix of CV signatures and other bad bot, you know, or, or you know, attack signatures. And at the same time, it gives you the ability to track users on an IP level. So if there's a, a certain number of requests which are being made from an IP address for a certain duration of time, you can identify that it's a threat and it's not a human, and then you can stop it. But the problem with that is, you know, simple bots used, you know, w w were, um, um, were used to do that. They used to come in from one IP. But like I said, the bot landscape has been improving, and now we are dealing not just with simple bots, but we have moderate bots and advanced bots. So moderate bots are the ones which cycle through maybe a few IPs and then change a couple of user agents, but the more advanced bots are using tools like Selenium, which drive legitimate browsers like Chrome and Firefox, and I have a live demo for you uh, later in the session where I could show you how uh, an advanced bot, wo uh, bot works and how it still identifies it. Um, 
So the problem with VAFs is they stop at the simple bot, but with the still, you can identify most of those moderate and advanced bots um, which are hitting your web application. And here's another graph which is um, speaking to the same results which we talked about earlier. So Drupal, once they started using the still, the, the number of block accounts um, drop to almost zero. All right, um, any questions about how this tool was being used by Drupal? Yes. That's a good question, and the next slide actually talks about it. <laughs> All right, so um, how do we generate the hash or the high definition fingerprint as we call it? So the still solution is a multi-layered fingerprinting technology. So there's a few levels of these fingerprints which we generate. The most basic fingerprint is being generated using well-known signals like IP address, user agent, HTTP headers. Um, but these are all spoofable. You know, I can use a plugin on my browser to change the user agent. I can use a VPN or a proxy to change my IP address. Um, you know, I, I can use a plugin to change the HTTP headers. So it's easily spoofable. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we decided to look beyond these basic signals. And uh, so as part of that, we collect a lot of other information like the 200 plus attributes. So we, you know, when you route traffic through Distill, Distill is an inline solution. So you have to basically route all your web traffic through us. We have different ways to do that. You can either use our SaaS cloud, which is a 17 data center node. You just make a DNS chain, route traffic through us, just like a CDN or you can put the distill appliance within your data center um, as a reverse proxy, and then you could draw traffic from your load balancer to distill. Doesn't matter, you know, the deployment model, at the end of the day, we are an inline solution which is sitting in front of your origin. And when we start inspecting these HTTP requests, um, if we are unable to identify the bot on the very first request, we'll let it through to the origin. The origin will process the HTTP request and respond back, and this still will intercept this HTTP response and inject a JavaScript snippet into the HTML code. And uh, we render this HTTP response to the end user's browser. The browser is now executes the distill's JavaScript um, snippet, and we are collecting 200 different attributes such as font size, screen resolution, um, and we are also looking at uh, things like uh, audio video codecs, plugin information, um, and um, what else? Yeah, we're seeing if the browser can execute and generate a 2D canvas, which is basically, you know, a, 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 um, a 2D image. So we have, a, you know, like 200 different attributes, which we will talk about uh, in detail for, um, at, at a later point in this presentation. But all this information is being collected from the browser, and it's being sent back to Distill. And Distill uses them in conjunction with the IP, the header, and the user agent to generate a high-definition fingerprint, which we call the hash. And then even though the user keeps moving from one IP to the other, we are still able to track the user um, when they are accessing your web application. And we understand that whenever a new technology comes out, there's bad bots or b bad operators or bad actors, whatever you call it, who are trying to reverse engineer, correct? So for that same reason, we do have some tamper proofing built into our solution. So um, we use techniques like JavaScript obfuscation, uh, proof of work, how many of you have heard about proof of work? It's a JavaScript-based uh, mathematical puzzle. It's, a, it's called hash cache challenge. So we serve a mathematical puzzle to the end user's browser, um, and we expect the browser to basically execute that mathematical puzzle and respond back with the correct answer. And a browser has the resources to uh, execute these puzzles and respond back, but a tool cannot, or a script cannot. Or you at least have to code around it to make sure that you are able to get through the proof of work challenge. So we have these tamper proofing layers built in so that we, we are not dealing with bots which are trying to reverse engineer and generate a, a fingerprint and get through the distilled uh, detections. Does that answer your question? Yeah. We are looking way beyond the headers and using the the headless browsers, yeah. So with all 
Exactly. So we're trying to see if there's, uh, you know, automation tools which are trying to mimic human behavior or headless browsers which are trying to mimic human behavior or s tools like Selenium which are driving legitimate browsers like Chrome and Firefox. Um, and that, that's what this JavaScript test is all about. So I'm going to quickly, you know, gloss over some slides which talk about the fingerprinting process so that you get the, the tech side of it and see how Drupal used the still uh, to identify, uh, you know, um, bad bots. All right, so um, as part of the detection process, what happens is when you start routing traffic through the still, the first request hits the still, and then we try and generate a, a low-level fingerprint at this stage called primitive ID. And then we compare the primitive ID with uh, known bad bot databases, which, which, you know, which just still curates. So we have a data science team which puts together a, a list of signatures which we have identified across our customer base, and we keep this up to date on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the same time, this database is also being um, is updated, you know, um, uh, uh, periodically by our platform automatically. Um, so if the end user signature doesn't match the bad bot signatures, which we already know about, then we'll proxy the first request through. And if it matches the signature, then we give the customers the ability to act against these bad bots. So you can stay in what we call monitor mode, and monitor mode is where you don't take any actions against the bad actors, uh, but we do give you the flexibility of serving back a challenge to the bots. So you can either serve a CAPTCHA challenge or a, an email block form, um, and this allows us to basically, um, you know, this allows us, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, us to basically um, validate if the user is able to um, um, you know, solve the CAPTCHA and get through or not. So in most cases, we, we, um, um, you know, we expect the bots to not solve the CAPTCHAs or, or fill out the email forms or the unblock forms, as we call it. So you know, this, this, these challenges would help us basically block the, the bots at the proxy layer. Um, so once again, like I mentioned, if we were unable to match the, the primitive ID with the known bad bot signatures, we would then proxy the first request to the origin. The origin would respond back with the content. The still would intercept that HTTP response, inject our JavaScript snippet and honeypot links, and we'll render that HTML code to the end user's browser. The browser is now going to respond back with the 200 plus signals, which we talked about. And then um, the still would use those signals to generate the high definition fingerprint. So that's the, the, the still fingerprinting process in a nutshell. And then the, some of the other policies and, and techniques which we use to identify bots, honeypot links, you must have you know, used them before in your previous life or you know, right, current, in, in your current life. But this is basically an invisible link which goes onto your web application. And this is only uh, visible to um, hum, you know, uh, sorry, bots. Because we, uh, when we, when we uh, inject uh, the honeypot link, we do use a tag called display none. So it's not visible to human users. So most of the simple and dumb bots get caught in these when they click on that link because it's invalid and they, it generates an HTTP request which uh, allows us to tag that user with a violation. And we briefly discussed about the, the distill injection process um, just a while ago. So it's helped, it helps us, uh, the distill JavaScript test helps us verify the JavaScript engine. So we expect most of the, the users who are accessing your web application to load and execute JavaScript because mo most of the modern applications uh, a lot, you know, need you to basically execute JavaScript. Uh, we are detecting automation, so if there's any Selenium or other tools which are driving the, the browser, legitimate browsers, then the JavaScript is listening to events which are being triggered in a browser's DOM. So if there's Selenium which is generating the HTTP request uh, and not a human, our JavaScript can detect that. Um, So we talked about the, the proof of work, the hash cache challenge. It's a JavaScript-based mathematical puzzle which is served to the end user browser for us to help and um, you know, make sure that the, the, the uh, fingerprints are not being tampered with. And just to recap, this still is a multi-layered fingerprinting technology. So we do have a primitive 
ID, which is generated using basic information like IP, header, and so on. And then the device fingerprint, which is the high def fingerprint, is generated using the 200 level at, you know, unique markers. So apart from these black and white rules, so we talked about known bad bot signatures, we talked about our JavaScript test. These are all, you know, rules which, you know, whether a, a, a bot could fail or a bot could pass. But there are sophisticated bots which are able to load and execute JavaScript. There are sophisticated bots which are able to support cookies. So what about these kinds of bots? So for that same reason, we know that some of these bots are really advanced, and that's why we came up with the concept of behavior and analysis. I mean, machine learning is not new, but you know, we basically put our own spin on machine learning, and we use different uh, vectors of information, such as where the request is being originating from. So the IP address, the geolocation, uh, how many distal fingerprints are they generating, and what part, uh, parts of your website are they hitting, at what frequency are they making the request. So these are the kinds of vectors which we look at to see what looks like a typical human behavior. And then uh, once we create this baseline, we'll know, you know if there's any anomalies um, uh, w w which are trying to access your web application. And then we give each of these anomalies a bot score. Um, just to give you a, a, you know, a, 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 snip, you know, a snippet into the, the 200 plus attributes, so we talked about our, you know, our ability to use the basic information like IP, user agent, headers, and we also you know, discussed about the JavaScript um, injection and how we could collect information such as plugin, screen resolution, font size, WebGL, canvas information, media, and so on. And that's our behavior analysis or machine learning process where we are basically trying to take the data points for every user who is hitting your website. And we try to generate a baseline based on uh, what looks like human. And then everything which falls outside of that baseline, we consider it as an anomaly. So, All right, so I am now going to jump into a quick live demo so that you can see how this still works in action. Sorry about that. All right. So what I did here is I opened up a Chrome Incognito session, and I have no automation running on this browser. So this is a, a, a legitimate browser session which is accessing a website called called Santos.lab, right? And let me go ahead and open developer tool so that I can see what's happening in the background. I'm going to reload this page once again. And what happens is every single HTTP request which is being made by this Chrome browser is now hitting distill first, it's getting inspected, and then we're deciding if this is a bad bot or not before we proxy it to the origin. Um, and as part of this, like I mentioned, the first request is proxied to the origin, Then we inject a piece of JavaScript snippet. Uh, by default, this is being injected right before the closing head tag, but we give you the flexibility to choose uh, where this JavaScript should be injected. And remember that the injection process is something which is automatically being done by Distill. We're not asking you to embed this on your backend, on your web application, because we want this to be as um, uninvasive as possible, and we don't want you to basically, um, you know, change your, change your um, application to, to implement this. Tip. And along with the, the JavaScript snippet, we are also injecting a honeypot link right after the first anchor tag. Like I mentioned, this is an invalid link, which is only visible to humans, sorry, uh, to bad bots, not to humans. And if, uh, when a bad bot clicks on this link, since it's invalid, it generates an HTTP request, we tag that fingerprint uh, as a violation. So th these are the two injections which um, Distal uses to identify these bots. So let's see what happens after, um, so when the browser gets the Distal JavaScript, uh, it executes it, and as we discussed earlier, the browser is collecting a, a bunch of different attributes 
like plugins, font size, screen resolution, and so on, and it is sending all this data back as payload in, the, the, in a post back, and then when Distill gets it, we are generating a list of different signatures, and we are asking the browser to set these fingerprints as cookies for all subsequent requests. So when the browser is making subsequent calls, we know that it's supposed to come in with these fingerprints, and if it doesn't, we'll force the end user's browser to basically, um, you know, uh, uh, to fingerprint itself again by executing our JavaScript. Any questions on the fingerprinting process? All right. Um, just to give you an idea on how this still stops bots, I'm going to open my terminal window and use some simple bot scripts. Uh, when I execute this curl command, you can see that uh, I'm not getting back a 200 OK, but rather this still is identifying this particular session as a bad bot, and it's responding back with a 405 status code. So 405 is a status code which is, uh, uh, you know, which represents our CAPTCHA page. So if you selected the threat response to block or drop, you would have seen a 416 or a 456 status code instead. Um, similarly, I can use um, another tool. Let's say I open another browser, Firefox, and I'm going to try and use an automation tool. How many of you have used Selenium before? Oh, a lot of web developers here, so I, I can completely relate to that. All right, so. Um, you know, Selenium IDE, it's an easy tool which you could, uh, you know, it's a plugin which you could uh, enable on your Firefox browser. And then Selenium IDE helps you basically automate whatever processes which you're running um, on your browser right now. So I have my Selenium IDE plugin set to record whatever is happening on Suntosh.lab through the Firefox session and have it running right now. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the the Firefox browser and try to access Santos.lab. When I do that, the requests are now going through Distill. We are injecting our JavaScript. We are waiting for that post back, and then uh, Distill immediately identifies that there's some kind of automation which is driving this Firefox browser. Even though Firefox is a legitimate browser, we know that Selenium is, uh, is an automation. So um, we're detecting that. And based on the, the threat response which was selected, we are responding back with a CAPTCHA. So we're challenging the end user um, you know, and, and to find out if he's a human or a bot. If he's a human, he can you know, type in the CAPTCHA and get through. If he's a bot, he's, he's got no other way to basically get through uh, apart from using any um, other services like Dead by CAPTCHA where they can make an API call to a CAPTCHA farm and um, solve that CAPTCHA. Um, when I go back to the Chrome session and try to access, access uh, another part of the website, I can still do that without any issues because my Chrome session was never tagged as a bot. It was always tagged as a human. So the goal of this exercise was to show you the accuracy of how to still identifies uh, bots versus humans, even though they're originating from the same device, from the same IP. So it just helps with the accuracy, and even if bots are cycling through different IPs, we can still track them with the, the high-definition fingerprints which we are generating for them. So how did Drupal use us? So Drupal basically um, you know, used our policies, which come built in with the product, to basically identify and block all the bots which are trying to register uh, fake accounts. And at the same time, for human users who are trying to register multiple accounts, uh, you know, Drupal basically wrote logic on the back end to look for accounts which were related to um, a specific UID. And then when they found multiple accounts which were registered with using the same UID, you know, they knew that uh, a, a human user was making multiple accounts from that same session. Any questions about the 
the fingerprinting process or how this will detect parts. All right, perfect. All right, so let's um, move on. So, this is also, you know, st started, um, you know, after we started identifying and blocking bad bots on web applications, bots basically start, you know, um, decided to, to take another turn and they started basically attacking API endpoints because, you know, APIs, as you know, are much easier targets because um, you could just, get the data in JSON or XML format, which is much easier to uh, use than what you are scraping off of web applications. And for that reason, they still came up with a, 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 an API security solution where we can sit in front of API endpoints and track the end users who are trying to consume your API endpoints. So we use uh, or we leverage unique identifiers uh, which you might be using today for identifying a session or a device um, of, you know, like a mobile uh, application uh, or, which is accessing your API, and then we generate unique profiles for these users who are, um, who, who, who are consuming your API endpoint. And we keep track of these you know, end users so that they're not abusing your API by sending thousands of requests in a second. So just to give you a gist of how the API security works, um, once again, we are uh, 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 an inline solution which is sitting in front of your origin, that is your API endpoint in this case, and we are, uh, you know, once you route traffic from either your native mobile apps or your dynamic web apps or your partners, they still will use a unique identifier or a token, match it along with the IP, and we use the combination of the IP and the unique identifier to create a profile and uh, to track users who are consuming your API endpoint. I think I'm gonna stop right here and see if you guys have any questions. That, that's all I have for the presentation, but do you guys have any, any, other, any other questions? All good? Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for attending this session. Do you have a question? Uh, like a DDoS flood, SIN flood? So when, you know, when we look at API attacks where there's multiple API calls cycling through different IPs, we do have built-in features where we are looking for uh, um, the number of tokens which are coming in from a specific IP or the number of IPs um, which a bot operator is using to cycle through different tokens. So we have, uh, you know, features to look for token cycling and IP cycling. Um, so if someone is trying to cycle through different IPs in an API case, we could still identify that and, and block these kinds of attacks. So there's specific thresholds which you can configure for, um, you know, for specific uh, end users who are hitting your API. And if you, if you, for example, let's say you don't think that a specific end user is supposed to make more than uh, 25 requests per minute. So you could set that as a threshold and, you know, and by creating these profiles, if I am going above that threshold, I'll be tagged with a violation and you can, um, act against me. Um, but if you have different users on, behind that same IP, they're gonna get their own token, so they'll have their own profile, so they'll be able to basically access your API endpoint without any uh, issues. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. So we do have something called browser integrity check. So we see what the browser is trying to, uh, you know, um, say it is, but then we try to validate and see what types of, uh, what versions of software 
or services which need, it needs to use. And if it doesn't match, we tag it with the browser integ uh, integrity check violation. So just remember that the distilled solution is not made up of one or two different policies, but we use multiple policies to identify uh, these bots. There's no silver bullet to how we do it. Uh, it it's, it's a combination of known bad bot databases, a JavaScript test, um, rate limiting policies, machine learning, the behavior analysis, like I mentioned. So you know, based on all these policies, if, if the bot uh, you know, triggers any one of them, we tag it as a violation. And just so that, you know, we still have, do we still have time? Yeah, I think we're over our time limit. Uh, but yeah, just to give you an idea on how the, on how the portal looks. So this is, the, this is how it looks. Um, you know, we basically try and um, break down the, the, the total traffic which is hitting your application into different buckets, humans, good bots, bad bots, and whitelisted. Any other questions? Sure. Is there a distilled plugin for Drupal? Is that what the question is? Yes. No. So distilled is a, a proxy solution, um, or in, in a, let me say it's an inline solution. So you can either you, you know implement as a as a reverse proxy in front of your origin, so wherever you're hosted. Um, you know, you have to basically route traffic through us either by putting a distill appliance within your data center or by making a DNS change and routing traffic through the distill cloud. So there's no Drupal plugin or a distill plugin which, uh, which you can implement on your application. Yes. Oh, can you repeat the question? You were not on. Well, we work with uh, customers who are hosted on different um, hosting services like Pantheon and, and, and Drupal. There's, uh, you know, a, a few um, items which we have to definitely um, cr check and cross-check and make sure that we are compatible with the application. But you know, that is uh, a part of the the the, the 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 validation process. So w when we start working with a specific client, we go through. Um, uh, you know, the, the wedding process. I'm just thinking about, we don't actually Sure. Absolutely. And we've worked with customers before who have uh, hosted their application in services like Pantheon and so on. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I remember what I was going to ask. Um, is, there, is there plans in the future um, for, I, I, we were with Drupal.org and uh, we participated in a case study in the webinar. And sure. Stuff, and um, one of my friends in the Drupal community came to me after and was like, oh, you know, I saw the case study. It was great. I, you know, I, we were like, we totally need something like that. We looked into it and it was, it was too expensive for any of our clients, right? Because uh, they have a large stable of small clients. But they were like, is there some way Absolutely. As, as a one, as, as like one call. Sure, absolutely. And we've done that before with others, so wow. you could definitely work with your account executive to um, have a partnership agreement instead of a customer type of agreement. Ah, right, okay. So that, that works better for smaller shops instead of being like, you need, you know, a $5,000 in your contract for one site. Yes. Well, thank you so much for attending the session today. Thank you. Yes, I was on a couple of calls, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just don't know if I was on the pre-sales calls, but I was definitely on some calls. Yeah, no, it was, um, I was looking for a, uh, 
browser fingerprinting solution that we didn't have to manage because, of course, yes. you have the 200 things. Oh, yeah. I remember now, yes. And, you you know. sent me a list of IIDs and UIDs and then yeah. you uh -huh. asked Yeah, me we were a pain in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, it was we're data science and you're data science here. Look at what we have here.